My name is Ryan Miller, and for the past 15 years, I've helped hundreds of people to raise millions of dollars for their funds and for their startups. If you're serious about raising money, launching your business, or taking your life to the next level, this show will give you the answers so that you too can enjoy your pursuit of making billions. Let's get into it. In this week's episode, I bring on Mariusz Konieczny. Mariusz is the founder and CEO of microcapexplosions.com as well as the Amazon author of 11 books on investing and equity analysis. Join us as he walks us through how he made 70,000% ROI by investing in microcap stocks. You don't want to miss it. Plus, Mariusz walks us through his exact process on microcap analysis, leading him to find the hottest investments in the most obscure corners of the market hunting for the best deals, conducting a thorough analysis, and monitoring asset growth can give you the insights you need in your pursuit of making billions. Here we go. Hey, welcome to another episode of Making Billions. I'm your host, Ryan Miller, and today I have one of my guests. Uh, he's a microcap investor, Mariusz Skoniecny. Uh, Mariusz is a microcap investor. He's the founder of microcapexplosions.com and the author of 11 books on Amazon. He's built a portfolio of investing in microcap uh, stocks and, and other interests that have resulted in nearly, get a load of this, nearly 70,000% ROI in just 10 years. This guy knows exactly what he's doing. When it comes to finding those obscure deals and going to those areas of the market, this guy is an expert. You're going to want to listen to everything he has to say. He's going to walk us through exactly on his process and all the wisdom that comes with investing in microcaps. So, Mariusz, welcome to the show, man. Yeah, hey, thanks. Thanks a lot for having me. Yeah, thanks for being here. So, uh, I've got to know you a little bit. Um, so, for our listeners around the world, why don't you walk us through exactly how, like, where did this come from, um, and and how did you get into this industry? So, maybe tell us a little bit about the origin story. Okay, so the origins really come from my background, uh, my background, and and well, first of all, I I was always interested in money. Ever since I was a kid, I was interested in money. Like mm -hmm. I wanted to be a cashier because I saw cashiers were counting money. So mm -hmm. like you know, I was just interested in money, money saving, investing. Yeah. But uh, as a kid, so I grew up in Poland. Uh, mm -hmm. I was born in Poland, and I came to the U.S. in 1996. Uh, but when I was a kid in Poland, so up to I'm um, 42, so I was 16 when I came to the U.S., um, I was all about sports. Mm -hmm. uh, tr I was a track and field uh, runner. I was a soccer player. Um, I was a basketball player. Everything in my life was about sports and competition. But mm -hmm. when I came to the U.S., uh, I wanted to play basketball because yeah. that was the time when you know, Michael Jordan, Chicago Bulls, Dream Team, 1992, Barcelona, 1992. Everybody wanted to play soccer. And, and of course, me too. So we, we were all playing soccer uh, outside all day long. But, but at that time, soccer was at its inception in Europe. So we didn't really have clubs. So when I had the opportunity to come to the United States, I wasn't coming here to, 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 to have a better life. I was coming here to play in the NBA. That was... <laughs> That was on my mind. Like I'm coming straight, and I was coming straight to Chicago actually. So I'm like, okay, I might just as well swing by Chicago Bulls and just sign up right away. <laughs> uh, so, so, so then you know, I, I came in the summer right after my freshman year of high school. So then, as the summer ended, and of course I wanted to be part of the basketball team in in my high school, and I did try out for the team, and I made the team, but. You know, I didn't speak the language, and uh, I, I I didn't I didn't feel like I was even given an opportunity because the team was already built. Uh, I never had a chance to play organized basketball, so it was more like he, this guy doesn't speak any English. He's on the team, but he never gets to play. So the entire season, I never played. I was just hmm. on the bench the entire time. In practices, I never really played, and then they let me play like thirty seconds. So. So that really broke my heart. I was devastated because I'm like, okay, I came all the way from Europe to the US and I don't even get to play. Uh, so at that point, I kind of stopped all the sports, everything. Like I stopped, pre uh, I stopped running because I, I ran for like one semester, um, but I stopped it all. Uh, I stopped playing soccer, stopped playing basketball. 
and uh, I kind of focused on uh, on other things, and which investing was one of it. But what I also realized that when I was uh, in high school, within like twelve months, I had to take SATs and ACTs, and yeah. I didn't even speak the language. So, so I didn't, you know, do well enough on the English portion or grammar portion. I did well in math and physical science, but not on the English portion. So, of course. I would never be competitive to get into the schools that, you know, everybody wants to get into. Uh, so that kind of put me on a path, be like, you know what, even though my life was all about competition, 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 now I have to look for things uh, that, that I can be competitive, that there, they, they, that there is not a lot of competition because anytime you have a lot of competition in anything, the mm -hmm. efforts that you put in uh, give you a, a very little rewards because the competition eat, eats away the the results. So that's kind of like how I started looking for things and places where there's very little competition. And it was just natural for me to find microcap investing because mm -hmm. there's barely any competition. And uh, to uh. define microcap investing, it's, it's small companies. It's companies that have a market capitalization of less than 100 million. And mm -hmm. they might trade on secondary exchanges like like TSX Venture or over the over the counter OTC in the US or Canadian Stock Exchange or AIM in London or there's a microcap exchange in Australia. Yeah. Uh, secondary exchanges. So uh, so there's very little competition out there uh, because because those companies are small. So Wall Street hedge funds, mutual funds, well, they're not going to play in that field because. The, the, uh, everything on Wall Street is about uh, assets under management. They, 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 that's the, it's not about returns. It's about how much money you manage and how much you make based on those assets under management. Sure. And if somebody manages a billion or two billion dollars, the last place they want to go is to, to a microcap uh, company because then not only not only they cannot really get significant positions in these companies, uh, they can exit them. And they would also have to find thousands of them to, to, to make it worth it for them. So institutions are out. They, they don't even compete in that space. And then, so then let's look at retail. Or, or retail. I mean, retail is chasing crypto, uh, Bitcoin. Uh, anything that's worthless, crypto is, is chasing, right? Anything stupid. AMC, GameStop, that's, that's where retail hangs out. Uh, so, so retail is out. Uh, so, so, and then who, who is left in those exchanges? Well, some, you know, sophisticated investors. But if you look at those exchanges, the majority of companies on those exchanges are, you know, gold, silver, mining, oil and gas, uh, cannabis, life sciences, uh, most of them, right? So, mm. so investors on those exchanges, they get high on pot and they're looking for gold, okay? <laughs> uh, and so again, yeah. so 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 you narrow it down even more, and uh, and then and then uh, I, I would say eighty to ninety percent of those companies on these exchanges, I mean they're they're completely something that I would never touch because they have great promises. They're going to change the world. They have cure for cancer. And they have the next gold deposit. I mean they all have fantastic yeah. things, right? Yeah. Uh, it's just. And then they, they also disrupt everything. Like, like they dis disrupt everything, but at the end of the day, what they do is they disrupt your wallet. So that's 80 to 90% of them. But then there's those 10 to 20% of them that are real businesses. Like right. they have real solutions, real clients, real technologies. And those are the ones that I go after. And uh, because they are on those secondary exchanges, very few people are looking at them. So I can, I can find them early on uh, do my full due diligence on them and uh, and generate you know incredible returns uh, simply because everybody else is on strike when it comes to those companies. Wow, that's that is outstanding. So you you're able to find these early stage uh, companies and it all came back to the early days and you when you realize even though you had your heart set on it, you had all this competition and you know normally that's fine, but the, I think the value here is that you realize, why not play a different game with limited competition? And that was a natural evolution to um, starting your career in, in investing in micro cap. Yeah. And, and, you know, I got a, I got a foundation in investing from reading everything about Warren Buffett okay. uh, that, you know, 
in, in, in stocks are not just ticker symbols stocks represent companies behind them mm-hmm. and uh and uh you know if the company does well the stock will do well over time right. and yeah. uh and i remember this one time when he was asked at the berkshire hathaway meeting what he would do if he was graduating from college and and had 10,000 to his name and he said that he would go into obscure places mm. uh and, like and to do secondary doing. exchanges and start with a and finish on z meaning look at every company and it's he would go there because the the financial industry wall street is not set up to take advantage of those opportunities so that's where he would go but but that doesn't guarantee you know i mean i don't want people to think that all you need to do is buy microcap stocks and you're going to get rich no it's it's an opportunity it's a place where you have a limited competition that's the starting point but then you actually have to find um you know the opportunities that are going to deliver the results i mean there's a mm-hmm. plenty as i said there's plenty of trash you, you can you can lose a lot of money there yeah. you know uh picking the wrong things but you know i don't need to go to those exchanges to lose, lose a lot of money i can i'm very capable of losing money on nasdaq i don't need to go there <laughs> to lose money so i go there for a specific reason <laughs> Yeah, that that's that's awesome. I love your sense of humor, man. So, you know, one one of the questions um, you mentioned that like Wall Street doesn't cover this, and a lot of people don't cover these things. So you're doing exactly what Warren Buffett said, and and good for you on picking up on that subtle piece of advice is you're finding those obscure places that Wall Street doesn't go. But you know, I think I'm wondering, and maybe the investors are as well, is why do investors not look at micro cap stocks? Like why why do they not even go there? Well, I mean, look at the look at the bad rap that the financial industry created. Uh, yeah. Microcap stocks, they call them penny stocks, worthless, worthless companies. Don't go there. It's it's dangerous. You're going to lose all your money. So, you know, they, they scare the heck out of you. And, and again, for a good reason, because if you invest in the 80 to 90 percent of them, you are going to lose your shirt. Right. So, so, so yeah, th- th- there is, there is a case there to be like, stay away from it. It's yeah. not for, it's not for people that just want to, you know, get a tip and buy. It's for people that want to roll up their sleeves and do the work that uh-huh. that's, that's where, you know, it is, but also it is a place where you have to pay the price, meaning that the volatility in those names is incredible. Like for example, right now we, uh, you turn on uh, the, the media and all you hear about is recession the fed raising interest rates the world is going to end so a lot of the names that i hold they are down a lot more than that some of them are down 60 70 80 percent because the market is you know sick right now uh but that's the that's the price you have to pay for being in those names like those drawdowns are are real and they're painful uh but if if you write on the company and you can take advantage of those drawdowns, you know, um, I mean, the returns speak for themselves. Yeah, that's phenomenal. So, so I think what I'm hearing is um, you've noticed a trend that a lot of the the market will say the general stuff that most people know about. You're saying there's this repeated um, messaging that's coming out, and it's driving it and. These stocks are, um, from from what I think I'm hearing from you, is that there's a lot of hype in the market, and that gets priced in, even though it's not a fundamental piece that should be considered, but it is priced into the the price is the hype of the market, whether it's overhyped while it's going up or overhyped while it's going down. Either way, there's uh, a are lack you talking of about the general market. Yeah, the general. What I, what I think you're saying here is you're just saying like, look, they keep hearing recession, 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 so people keep believing that recession after you hear it a hundred times and well and the, 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 the reaction the reaction to the recession is a lot worse than the actual recession yeah okay and and it, right now we're going through a complete opposite of what we were hearing in in 2000 yeah. in 2000 when we were locked down uh, what was the message well buy buy uh buy amazon buy netflix buy um uh, What's this? Uh, Zoom. Uh, Zoom. Zoom. Yeah. Buy Zoom because everybody's yeah. going to be using Zoom. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Buy yeah. Netflix because everybody's going to be signing up uh, for Netflix and staying at home. Buy, yeah. buy Amazon stock because everybody's going to stay at home and order 
uh, on Amazon. Okay, the stock went up. And then two weeks later, buy Amazon because people are going to be staying at home. Uh, three weeks later, buy Amazon because people are gonna, like, okay, like how many times are you going to tell me that? <laughs> like, 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 don't you think, don't you think it's kind of priced in already? Like, yeah. I get it. I, Amazon is a good company, but like, it, does it mean it's the price is unlimited? Like, seriously, it's like, you know, you're buying a house and then uh, the seller says $100,000 and you're like, okay. And then the seller says, but there is a pool in the back. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, I'll pay you 10,000 more. But there's a pool in the back. Yeah, I know. You already told me. But there's a pool in the back. Okay. All right. I got it. You have a pool in the back. The price is 110. Do you want me to pay you a million dollars just because you told me there's a pool in the back 50 times? Yeah. Like that doesn't work like this. And yeah. now, and that's what it was. That's what yeah. it was during 2000. Like, right. like it was just ridiculous. Like mm-hmm. watching these stocks go up for no reason. And now, now it's like, don't buy stocks because there's a recession. Don't buy stocks because there's recession. Uh, don't buy stocks because the Fed is raising interest rates. So, so now it's like it's like it's like you're trying to sell a house, and then the and then the seller is like a hundred hundred ten thousand, and you you, mm-hmm. you you say, but there's no pool in the back. Okay, well we'll pay you a hundred, but the seller the buyer says there's no pool in the back. There's no pool in the back. Yeah. Like okay, yeah. all right, I know there's no pool in the back. Okay. Yeah. Do yeah. you want me to give you the freaking house for free because there's no pool in the back? <laughs> like, do you want me to pay you to take my house because there's, there's no pool in the back or yeah. because the Fed is raising interest rates? But that's yeah. where we are. It's like okay. people are just dumping some of these companies as if they were worthless because we're going to have a recession. It's like, mm-hmm. okay, I've heard it so many times that I am like, I'm going to murder somebody next time I hear we're going to have a recession. I yeah. would love to have a recession because yeah. then finally we could have one and maybe finally people will start talking about recovering from recession instead of talking about uh, recession is coming you know but that's where we are right now so yeah. so there's incredible opportunities in 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 stocks some stocks especially microcap stocks because yeah. you know the sellers are just like they don't want to hold anything yeah yeah so let's talk about that so um, when you're looking for companies, and I can tell you got you got a lot of a lot of passion, a lot of fire about this this messaging, and rightly so. You're, you, I mean, we're saying like, look, man, it's priced in, move on. But it's like, look, it, it's not, it shouldn't keep going down, even though it is. You're like, this isn't rational. It's hype in both directions, and it's like, you guys. So a way that I, I think that you're saying is like, you can avoid all that to some degree. By just going to a different spot of the market, which is microcap. So when you look for microcap stocks, what are what are some of the things that you look for when you're kind of opening up uh, your analysis and looking to place an investment? Well, it depends if I if I look for uh, for an income play or if I look for an asset play. Okay. Uh, if I'm looking for a company that generates income revenues, then I then I want that company to have real clients. Like, like I want them to have real customers because otherwise it, when somebody has revenues, then, mm-hmm. then the product is proven. Somebody voted with their money and said, you know what, we want to use you for whatever because you're solving our problem and, uh, and, and that's a proof. So I, I want the company to have revenues and then I, mm-hmm. want, I want there to be, I don't want to pay too much for a company yeah. like this. Mm-hmm. In other words, uh, you know, I don't want to pay too high of a multiple of a revenue. Mm-hmm. If, if it, it doesn't, I don't have a requirement that they have to be profitable because a lot of the times smaller companies are on such a growth trajectory that they might sacrifice the current profitability for growth or because the growth is so big that, you know, there's going to be profits in the future. So, so I'm looking at, I'm looking at revenues. I don't want to pay too much for revenues and I want the revenues to be high quality revenues in other words i want them to be high high margin revenues i want them to be recurring revenues so that every january they don't start from scratch i want though i want the clients to have some kind of uh switching costs that it's not easy to just dump dump them and go to somebody else so that that's that's straight lessons from warren buffett like he i want good businesses recurring revenues and uh and you know, and I don't want to overpay for them. And and it's okay if I overpay for them just a little bit, as long as the growth will catch up. And in the future, you know, four, four, four or five years down the road, the company is going to be worth much more than what I'm paying for today. That's okay. Um, and uh, and yeah. So, but but because 
every company on these exchanges is a pioneer. Every yeah. company is a disruptor, right? Every company mm -hmm. has the best thing in the world. <laughs> I, I have to do a, a better due diligence okay. than than just for regular companies. So that's that's when I do what's called scuttlebutt, mm -hmm. where I talk to people that are involved with the company. So I'll get on the phone and I'll start calling all customers. Mm -hmm. I want to hear from the customers like, hey, why are you using this product? What's so special about this product? Is it hard for you to switch? How did you find this company? Would you recommend it to somebody else? I want to hear from the customers what's so special about this company. And then I'll try to uh, research who the directors are. Why are you the director of this company? How do you know the CEO? And then uh, employees, former employees, suppliers. I, I love talking to former employees because you know they're not afraid anymore. Yeah. And if there is some dirt on the CEO or or, or, or some insiders, uh, they do not hold back. So I want to know everything. And it's not because I want to find a perfect company because there isn't one, but I want to know what I'm getting myself into. Like, you know, is, is the CEO a crook? Is he an honest person? Uh, because, you know, you talk to the CEO, of course he's a nice person, right? But <laughs> like, is he really a nice person yeah. by, you know, talking to these other people? So, so I, I go really deep with, these, uh, with the analysis. So that's on the income side. And then if I get involved on the asset side, well, you know, you can have uh, entities that might have an asset, like they might have a, a copper, like, like I'm involved in a copper project uh, that, that the company has in, in Mexico. Um, then they might have a technology that might be solving a major, major problem. And that technology might, if, if they were to be acquired by somebody else, and mm -hmm. it might sell for multiples what I'm paying for in the market cap. Um, so, and, and assets, it's like, look, there's so many different assets out there. You know, there, you have equipment, you have cars, you have, you have uh, properties, you have real estate. So it just depends, like, what kind of assets they have. And, and then if I know what the asset is, then I'll figure out how to value it. Um, and, you know, so that, that's the kind of stuff I'm looking for. Yeah, I love that. And, uh, you know, how do you, for example, on the asset plays, um, you know, how do you like lawsuits? Do you look for anything like that? Or, I mean, wh what are some of those, those areas? Uh, if you could maybe round that out a little bit more. Yeah. So, so the lawsuits are interesting because lawsuits is an area where uh, investors just don't want to look at it. They, they have a, they're like lawsuit. No, no, thank you. I'm not going to study it. I mean, yeah. I mean, Lawsuits are, are like, not every lawsuit is the same. So, sure. so the, the, the copper play that I was involved with, mm -hmm. so it's a company called Oroco, yeah. O-R-O-C-O. And, uh, and this one was almost 100, 100x for me uh, from, the, from the time that I bought it to, to the peak before, before the recent sell-off. Sure. And it was an interesting situation because... When I looked at it, it had a market cap of uh, $3 million. Yeah. And then at the height, it had a market cap of like $800 million. And so what happened there was that uh, there was a dispute, legal dispute. In 2000, in the year 2000, when the price of copper was in a terrible bear market, <clears throat> some, some investors were looking for a copper, uh, copper deposits because sure. they were they were expecting that China was going to happen, the huge mm -hmm. development in China. So they were kind of buying up projects that were out of money mm -hmm. uh, at that point. And so this, this guy from Arizona, he, he's dead now, thank God. Uh, he bought the uh, copper asset called Santa Tomas Copper Project from a Mexican guy who owned it at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, he didn't pay for it. So he, he bought it. They transferred the title. And he, he didn't pay for it. Hmm. So then the Mexican guy wanted the property back. He wanted to legally get it back. But hmm. the problem was that the property was in Mexico. The crook was in Arizona. And then uh, some of the paperwork was in Bahamas. So it was like three different, three different jurisdictions. And there's no way this guy would have the money to fight the legal battle to get it back. So mm -hmm. Oracle came and they said, hey, we can finance the legal battle. 
We're going to get you the property back. And in return, we will earn 50% interest in that property. Well, that property was worth 500 million when I looked at it. So market kept 3 million and I'm like, that thing is worth 500 million. And, and how did I know? Well, because it's a, it's a very known property. It's, it's been around for a long time. The property has been drilled with about 100 holes in the 60s and 70s. It had a historical net present value. It was cited in uh, geological books to show students what a good copper deposit is. So it wasn't that hard to figure out what it was worth. I mean, the net present value on it was over a billion dollars. And so I was like, okay, uh, the world needs copper. At some point, somebody's going to buy it. Somebody's going to pay 50% of uh, net present value. And here's your 500 million value. Uh, and, but, you know, the situation was when I got involved is that they already, they already won the legal battle in Bahamas, mm -hmm. but Mexico was not recognizing that win because they committed another fraud in Mexico. Uh, but what was happening in Arizona was that crazy enough, Oracle owned both of the entities that were part of the lawsuit. So that mm. the lawsuit in Arizona was about foreclosing or taking through receivership the other ownership interest that they are fighting with. Mm. So I was like, okay, if they win this, they're going to own both entities and cancel everything. And then they're going to do whatever they want. So yeah. I focused on studying the, the legal situation in Arizona and how that was going. And since I speak English, I was able to buy directly legal documents directly from the courthouse as they were happening. And it was clear to me that the other party had no case. It, mm. I mean, they were just losing every single statement. So then I was like, this is just a matter of time before this completely finishes up. Nobody wants to study it. I was the only one studying it. I mm. was buying the legal documents from the courthouse. I was on the phone with the judge. Like I knew more about the legal lawsuit than the company itself because the company had to wait for the lawyers to tell them the, to give them the legal documents. I already had them the moment they came out. Um, so, so of course the, 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 they won the legal lawsuit, then the market figured out what was going on and then it started getting reprised. And then I started talking about it on my YouTube channel and writing about it. And you know, the next, the, the, the long story short is, uh, is that, you know, I mean, this, the stock went up almost a hundred times, hmm. uh, and you know, I made a life changing returns on that one. Wow. That's that's a crazy story, and I and I hope uh, in in case or not, I hope our listeners are really seeing that you know in the beginning, uh, Mario talked about um, you know going where there's not a lot of competition, but by no means. And I think if you hear this story and the amount of work that he put in to find this deal and make a hundred x return, which I mean those are those are crazy returns, but no competition doesn't mean you don't work hard. In fact, you probably are working harder now. So you got to dig, you roll up your sleeves, you find out what's going on. And there's a competitive advantage of the mispricing that exists in microcaps is what I think I'm hearing. But well, and there's also, a ton there of is work. A, there's also uh, a advantage, informational advantage that you have because, yeah. because okay, you have no analysts covering them. No, no analyst knows anything. Uh, very few people want to do that kind of work. A very few people want to get on the phone with the management. I mean, that's an advantage because the management of these small companies will talk to you, right? They will pick up the phone and you, you, you don't get that with big companies. You think the CEO of Microsoft is going to pick up the phone and talk to you? Not a chance. But, but even, even if they did, like, okay, let's say I put a lot of work into studying, you know, this copper play. Uh, I could I could put just as much work into studying Microsoft, right? Know mm -hmm. everything about the pra, uh, their software, but what good does it do? All my effort, all the effort wouldn't generate any returns because everybody already knows about Microsoft. Everybody knows that Microsoft is a is a dominant player and uh, and this this and that. Sixty analysts are covering it and studying it all the time. What's the point? Like my, it, it's like trying to trying to play basketball in the NBA. I can practice all day long, but I'm 5'11", I'm not going to play, okay? It doesn't matter. But if I go and do something that there is very little competition, 
then then my efforts take me further. And at the end of the day, does it matter if I make my millions on micro caps or, or big cap stocks? It doesn't matter. The, the money in the bank is money in the bank. If, mm -hmm. I, if I'm buying a, a car or a house, nobody's asking me, oh, you know, this money is not real because you made it in the micro caps. That's right. So I, I love that. So you're saying, look, like if you're going to dig in and be a serious professional investor, like I would say you are, um, there's a lot of work involved, but there are big profits to be made. So if you're willing to put in that work, put it in the right place where there's limited uh, competition, as well as an asymmetric um, access to, to information. And you're able to get people on the phone and ask them what's going on. And not that you get any insider information, but they, you know, obviously they they don't share that. But you're able to really understand the business, is what you're saying. Say, you know, tell me about the business. What kind of customers do you have? Like very high level research kind of stuff. And and from that, you can get like you just did on that copper deal, a hundred x when you really understand what's going on from the perspective of the executive. So it's absolutely brilliant. So um, moving on, like. One of the questions that I have is, and maybe many of our listeners today are, what are some of those advantages? Uh, I know we rattled off a couple, but you know, from your opinion, if you had a few bullet points, like what are some of those advantages of investing in microcap? Well, number one is what we already talked about, which is uh, limited competition. Yeah. And number two is uh, a competitive advantage with information. Hmm. Number three is you get, you get to talk to them, uh, management. Yeah. Um, uh, Number four is a lot of times you don't pay a lot for those companies because, uh, because again, you know, in order for those companies to be expensive, you have to have a lot of buyers willing to buy. Mm -hmm. And if, if 99.9% .9 of us investors don't even know that these exchanges exist again, like they're not going to bid up these prices. So, 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 um, so I have a margin of safety mm -hmm. if I'm a value investor, right? I'm not overpaying for them simply because n not too many people are buying them. So like, I, 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 I can't get those kinds of deals on NASDAQ That's right. because most of the companies that are good on NASDAQ, they're overpriced. I mean, maybe now they're reasonable because, you know, we're getting the sell off, but most of the time they're overpriced because think about this. NASDAQ and New York Stock Exchange, they, these are the two exchanges the, that the entire world is watching. The entire world, people from Europe, from Asia, everybody invests in the US. They, we only have those two exchanges. So, and, and how many stocks are trading on NASDAQ? I don't know, 6,000 maybe? Like, I, if you're talking about billions of people, like, like you, you think you're going get, to get a good deal? Like, okay, maybe. Uh, yeah. But, you know, on those exchanges, you can get, I mean, like I said to you, 3 million market cap for Oracle and the, the, the asset was 500 million and it didn't yeah. take a genius to figure out that it was worth at least that much. And then, and then a few minutes, um, a few hours, you could have figured out that the lawsuit was in the bag. Like, like that's, that's almost like, that's almost like taking money from children. Yes. You know, like that's the game I want. I want to play a game that I can win. Mm-hmm. That's right. Stacking the deck in your favor is sometimes the way that I like to call it is just like, how do you stack the deck? I mean, there are, there are legitimate ways that are completely compliant to all the rules if you're willing to roll up your sleeve and just figure out what's going on. So, um, you know, really quick, what are you mentioned them earlier, but maybe you could summarize, like, what are some of the markets that you find a lot of the best deals in? Well, I like to focus on the three uh, TSXV, which is Toronto Stock Exchange Venture. Mm -hmm. OTC over the counter mm -hmm. uh, in the US and then uh, Canadian Stock Exchange um, there's there's more you can you can go to AIM in London which is like a subset of the London Stock Exchange and then there's one I don't remember the name in Australia but I find a lot of I find a lot of deals in Canada and US I don't f I have so many deals that like I don't have enough money to put into them. Why would I want to go somewhere else? I was yeah. thinking like maybe in the future I can go to like some of the countries. Yeah. Uh, like you see, I speak Polish, right? So like Warsaw Stock Exchange and just like mm -hmm. 500 companies listed or something. I could go through every single one and see if I can find deals. Uh, but I don't feel like I need to do this. Uh, one other thing that what I like about 
the OTC and the Canadian markets is that a lot of the the real companies that have real something real, they have ab- ambitions to mm-hmm. go to Uplist, to Nasdaq or New York Stock Exchange. And I have a few that are in the process. So that's music to my ears because, you know, I get to build a position when nobody's paying attention. And then I have a huge position. And then when they go to NASDAQ, the entire world is going to know about it. They're going to get exposure. They're going to get all this. And I already have a position. So so I'm not sure if I could get that by investing in companies in Warsaw Stock Exchange. They, they might stay on that exchange and, and be cheap forever. Uh, yeah. But you know, when they do get uplisted to NASDAQ or New York Stock Exchange, you, you expose them to a much, much bigger audience. But then again, it's not guaranteed that those companies are going to get um, uh, that the prices are going to be adjusted. But I don't need a guarantee. I yeah. just need a bigger pool of people looking at them. And if those companies are truly good as they say they are, I'm not worried about readjustment. They're going to get readjusted because you know people are greedy, and once they see money, they're going to you know price them correctly. I love that, and you know as, as you're speaking, I'm thinking maybe that's a third pillar of your investment strategy at income strategy at, or income plays, asset plays, maybe potential market plays. People that are looking to jump into the next market is also something that sounds like I mean, that uh, you've been well, able most to of value. my companies have, uh, have plans to go on NASDAQ at some future, Yeah, you know, but they have to be, they have to be big enough, which, which is fine. You know, I can hold them for, but, but what's interesting, let's say, let's say if you have a company that has a, a ten million dollars of revenues, yeah, and it's trading at one times revenues, mm-hmm. so it's trading at market cap of ten million, right? And it's growing. And I know that probably in five years down the road, maybe the revenues can can be a hundred million, okay? Mm-hmm. And then so so think about this: if they if their revenues are a hundred million and they go on Nasdaq, and then they show profits, do you think they're going to trade at one times revenue? Heck no. Not a chance yeah. that they might trade at ten times revenues, right? So, mm-hmm. so, so that's a hundred beggar because yeah. you get a ten x on your money just from revenue going from ten million to a hundred million, and then you get another ten x on the uh, multiple expansion. That's how you can make life changing returns. Wow. So I hope everybody can see um, all of the things that you're talking about, the um, the magnitude of the returns. And that's why uh, nobody uh, makes 70,000% ROI uh, without uh, being able to make some significant returns. So, you know, as as we round the corner and, and really wrap things up, um, is there anything else you would like our fans to know before we la- wrap things up? Yeah, it's uh, don't think it's don't don't think it, that it's in a straight line. Yeah. Uh, I mean, my portfolio is hugely volatile and I go from being a hero to being a zero. Like, for example, <laughs> uh, before the market turned and my stocks, all of my stocks were flying high, I was getting presents. I was getting chocolate sent to my house. I was getting yeah. pictures of families. Oh, you changed my, you, you, you did this to for my family, blah, blah, blah. One guy even told me that I help, that I help end prostitution in Asia. Yeah, because wow. whatever money he makes, he can donate and, you know, he helps pr- uh, prostitutes uh, get out of prostitution and go to college or whatever. Wow. So I was a hero. And now that the stocks uh, are down a lot, yeah. because that's yeah. what you would expect in a bear market and those micro cap names get crushed even more. Now I'm not, I'm not getting any gifts right now. My portfolio went from like 10,000 to 100,000 to uh, 50,000 to half a million to 70,000 to 1 million, to 300, to 7 million, now 2 million. And it's like, it's, all, it's crazy. Yeah. And so if you don't have stomach, stomach volatility, don't even go to those places. Yeah, got it. All right. Well, you know, so as we wrap things up, um, learn to work, um, but work smart in the areas where there's limited competition. And, you know, learn to roll up your sleeves, find those areas and those, um, those companies that maybe Wall Street isn't quite looking at yet because they're too small. You do those things and you will be well on your way in your pursuit of making billions. Wow, what a show. 
I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I did. Now, if you haven't done so already, be sure to leave a comment and review on new ideas and guests you want me to bring on for future episodes. Plus, why don't you head over to YouTube and see extra takes while you get to know our guests even better. And make sure to come back for our next episode where we dive even deeper into the people, the process, and the perspectives of both investors and founders. Until then, my friends, stay hungry, focus on your goals, and keep grinding towards your dream of making billions.